There, it's me, Stephen Thomas with Reports on Housing. Yes, we have another housing debrief. Thank you so much for joining us once again. This week, we're focusing on 7% rate sting housing. When will they drop? So uh, rates have crept their way back up from six, right above 6.5%, all the way up to surpassing 7% recently. And uh, first, we're going to go kind of to understand where we're at right now, why rates have risen, uh, what's going on with rates, because we, the, we are very uh, rate sensitive as a country. As, as far as the housing market is concerned, extremely rate sensitive. 7% seems to be this giant barrier. It's a psychological barrier for just about everybody out there. 8% was huge back in October, but this is right at the springtime and we're hitting 7% interest rates. And we were above 7% for quite some time uh, last year from the end of July all the way to the second week of December. And it really created a slow down the sluggishness sluggishness easy for me to say and uh we're but we've made our way back up towards seven percent interest rates just eclipsed it a little bit and that's where rates sit today so let's do this mortgage rate update so we understand what's going on and then we'll we'll show you how it is already impacting housing and uh so as far as where are we right now, as far as the economy is concerned, it's like one of those things where you hear so many different variations of where they think we are. Part of the problem is economists like to stick things in a box and then carry it forward. And I've heard everything from post-World War II, uh, making our way from uh, post-World War II to the 60s, to the 70s, to the 80s. And this could be another great recession type of thing. So this has been compared to so many decades. It's really something uh, different. We have not been here before. So where we are today is the uh, Fed has inflicted a lot of pain on the uh, the economy. They said they were going to do it in August of 2022. Uh, that is where they already were ratcheting up rates, but they weren't happy when interest rates dropped all the way to 5%. They didn't want it for housing. They didn't want it for uh, the stock market, which was going crazy. So they had to reorchestrate where things were headed and say, you know what, we're not done and we're going to go further. So they said that they were going to cause a lot of pain for consumers and businesses back in August of 2022. Rates continued to escalate even higher. And they have been on this war path because they're, they have a, a dual mandate. One of them is to keep inflation tame and under control. They have a 2% target for inflation. The other thing is full employment. So they're meeting the objective of full employment. As a matter of fact, it is really hot in the employment department, but inflation has been a little bit off its, off its rocker. So uh, as a result, uh, they're still continuing to uh, pursue inflation. And I'll tell you kind of where we're at today. So the United States economy has been extremely resilient. 2023 was a very resilient year. We were supposed to have recession, didn't because the consumer came out with the vengeance. They were spending like nobody else's business. Uh, GDP was way up. It was a very, very strong year and it exceeded just about everybody's expectations out there. The Fed remained extremely hawkish, extremely hawkish all year long. And they got really hawkish in October because they saw that they, that uh, there was a, a lot of a lot of investors and and a lot of economists were talking about the Fed pivoting down the road, and they wanted to set the record straight. So they came out with a vengeance again in October. They meet about every six weeks, and in every three months they come out with where they think interest rates should go. And they're always talking about the short term rate, but where they think short term rates should go is where uh, long-term rates then go almost immediately. So when they start projecting out where they're going to go, you start to get this movement in more mortgage rates. Or if uh, the investors think this is where the Fed's path is going to be, they start making moves prior to the Fed even making a move. Now, when they're extremely hawkish and continue to come out, this Fed has spoken like no other Fed in the past. They were extremely hawkish in October. They put out their dots and they said there's only going to be one quarter point decrease in all of 2024. So basically, these interest rates are going to be higher for longer. And so then uh, interest rates made their way all the way up to 8%. 
We had 8% interest rates in October and the Fed met again and they started talking it down. Then they met in December and new dots came out. So they met in September, these dots came out. Then they started to change their tune and in December, they talked about having three rate cuts in 2024 and four in 2025. Although they really don't know where they're gonna be in the future, even though a lot of people look at this and say, this is their path. They, no one really knows what the path of rates is going to be uh, off that, that far into the future. But change their tune from one quarter of a point drop to three quarter point drops for 2024. And then they changed their language. Their language was seen as, dovish. So they went from hawkish to this dovish language in a short period of time. That was just a few months. It was kind of like this, this about face in, in as far, as far as their language is concerned. A lot of people said they pivoted. The only pivot that they've done is they've pivoted a little bit in language. That's about it. They haven't pivoted as far as saying that, you know what, we have to change everything and we're going to see, we're going to start chasing this uh, economy down. We're going to be reducing rates quite a bit. That's not what they're talking about. There. Uh, instead, what, what happened in December is we saw interest rates come all the way down to 6.62%. Uh, they dropped like a vengeance, all the way down to 6.62%. And as a result of coming down so far, they were above 7%. They were above 7%, like I said, since the end of July all the way to the second week of December, and then we had rates drop because of what the Fed said after they met. They actually didn't like how far interest rates came down, so they started to say, hey, I don't know uh, about uh, about all the investors and every all the economists saying that, that, that the Fed is going to be cutting rates. It's going to happen. Maybe it's going to happen in 2024, but we just don't know when, and it's not going to be as many rate cuts as what you all think. And at that time, Wall Street was pricing in five rate cuts. They only talked about doing three. So we saw the rates come down to 6.62%, which originally was a green shoot because it, for real estate and for the for the for all of the housing market across the United States, when we get above 7%, that's a threshold that starts to slow down the overall uh, locomotive of the housing market. So that economic engine the housing slows down once uh, rates pop above 7%. And But now that rates have come down below 7%, 6.62%, we started to hear the Fed coming out over and over and over again, talking about you guys have it all wrong. It's not gonna be, we're very data dependent. We're gonna have to see more in the data. And then the data started coming out and started spooking Wall Street. And then we also had the Fed meet again at the end of January. They weren't doing anything, uh, talking about interest rates as far as where it's gonna be in the future, as far as where they project rates to be, because that's only done every quarter. So it was done in October, December, and it's coming up in March. But they met again at the very end of January. And so they met and they said, we're not going to be changing rates again. And their language changed a little bit and his Q&A helped a bit. Uh, and then we got a couple more uh, readings from the economy. And the economy, right after they met, there were the jobs report. And the jobs report is actually the number of job openings on the left and it actually rose a little bit, which means there was even more job openings. And unemployment was really, really low already. And then uh, if you look over here, Mar uh, this is uh, the number of jobs created. There were 353,000 jobs created and there were supposed to be like half that many. So all of a sudden this big uh, over uh, achieving jobs uh, arena, this jobs report and the market reacted. And what happens is now they think, uh-oh, the Fed's not going to change interest rates as much. So what happens is we get a change in rates on those kind of days because uh, it's, it's positive economic news, positive for the economy, which is, means that we're going to be higher for longer because we need the economy to slow a bit because that's what the Fed wants to see. They want to see more movement in the numbers as far as jobs. That's what their number one focus is, is on. And there are other reports that kind of pave the way to where jobs will be as well as where inflation will be. So then after they met, this is the end of January, this is the first week of February. This is the first Friday. It's just a few, a couple days after the Fed met. I think on the 31st, it was his, was his speech. Then a couple days later, we're on February 2nd, this jobs report comes out. And then over the weekend, prior to Super Bowl, 
Chairman Powell actually comes out and has this uh, 60 Minutes interview. And he says so many things in the 60 Minutes interview that are very revealing, because this is now Q&A, and Jerome Powell actually gets off script when he does these uh, Q&As as well. Uh, you can see that when, when he does his speeches and afterwards they do a Q&A. Well, this is Q&A on 60 Minutes. And then as a result, Things changed the following day, because that comes out on Sunday, Monday, uh, the, uh, the following week. This is the Monday before Super Bowl. All of a sudden, we have another change in rates. What happens is there is a lot of money parked on the sidelines, and they will participate in the bond market and when things start to cool down. And they're expecting things to cool down sometime this year but not based upon the language of the Fed, it's gonna happen later rather than sooner. So those investors with all this cash, there's a plenty on the sidelines, like Warren Buffett sitting on more cash than ever before, the 10-year treasury, that investor is looking at 10-year treasuries, it's the same investor that's looking at mortgage-backed securities. So when the yields on 10-year treasuries go down, mortgage-backed securities go down as well as interest rates go down. The yields on treasuries go up, the yields on mortgage-backed securities go up, and interest rates go up. They are hand-in-hand. Hand. They've kind of been dancing together since 1972. And so it goes all the way back then to now. There's been this love affair. So there's this close correlation between 10-year treasuries and mortgage-backed securities and and, uh, and uh, where interest rates are. And you can see, now I'm going to show you what 10-year treasuries are. I actually wake up every morning, look at where 10-year treasuries are, look at the economic readings, the reports for the day. And from that, I can see, based upon the readings, what's happening with the 10-year treasury. When it's down as little as this, like 0 0.008, which was a couple days ago, that actually shows you where interest rates are going to be for the day, probably flat. It's not a big change. We get big movements in this down or up based upon inflation reads as well as job reports and things like that or, uh, or uh, con 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 consumer confidence changes a little bit. There's a whole bunch, a myriad of, of uh, different economic numbers that we follow. So you can see that interest rates, here we are, you can see how in, where interest rates have gone in the past to where they are uh, to today. This is the 10-year treasury. You can see that red line, how things have come up. So interest, interest rates and 10-year treasuries came down nicely all the way to uh, right before the start of this year, but slowly but surely, they've been creeping their way up higher and higher and higher. And here we are, uh, we're above 7% again. And uh, look, this trajectory looks very, very similar to the 10-year treasury. Because like I said, there's this love affair. There's this close correlation between the two. And as long as the economy is chugging along too hot for its britches, like it did all of 2023, you're looking at a rate range between 65 and 8%. It shouldn't go as high as 8%, but it only does that when investors get a little bit overzealous. It shouldn't go as low as 6.5% either. should be in a short range between about 6 and 3 quarters and about 7 and, and a half percent is kind of where that normal range is, but it goes outside those ranges based upon the overzealous uh, nature of investors or when they react, they react too much. And there, so we've been a little bit too hot for our britches uh, as far as the economy is concerned, especially those initial readings for the months of December and January, which we got in February. We're going to, we're starting to see some cautionary flags that are out there that nobody's really talking about, but they are for real flags that will start to slow down our economy. And you can see this. This is the consumer price index. This is the uh, CPI. This is just a basket of goods and and uh, what what's going on with this basket of goods uh, as far as inflation on a month-to-month -month basis. I need everybody to understand, when they say inflation has uh, is, is tame and is at 2% and it's not going up like it did before, that does not mean that we're getting prices coming down. That's called disinflation. You don't want to root for that. That's not what's happening here. Just that you could see with this inflation index that it's gone way up and it's coming way down and it's actually coming down nicely. There was a little problem with this latest CPI report and that is something that has to do with what they call owner equivalent rent. It's on the shelter side of things and it's such a strange metric that they follow for this consumer price index and they need to stop but they still do it and 
the it, they rely on this thing so it actually uh it went up for the first time when it should be going down for the first time in like 30 years it makes absolutely total it's like nonsense the way that it's collected i won't even get into the weeds on, on explaining all that stuff but not the best gauge on where things are going you can tell what's the trend the trend is it's coming down i'm pointing to the purple line which is core because you strip out the volatility of food and fuel and you get a true gauge of what's going on with prices prices are coming down and a lot of commodities prices are flat and uh you could see also this other thing it's called pce there's a whole bunch of uh of these different in indexes that we that we follow yeah and the only reason why i bring it all up is because they all affect uh, interest rates because it affects the 10-year treasuries, it affects uh, mortgage-backed securities, which affects interest rates, which ultimately affects the real estate market because we need interest rates to be below 7% to un uh, bind the real estate market, which has been stuck. It's kind of frozen. There is not a lot of homeowners participating, not a lot of buyers participating. It's just not a lot of sales at all. So if you're rooting for housing and housing becoming ungummed so that people can participate and buyers can actually buy, then what you're rooting for are rates to come down so it's more affordable for buyers and more homeowners will be more inclined to sell their homes. And so PCE actually is the gauge that, that the Federal Reserve likes to follow. They like to follow, and actually, the last several months have been below 2%. Uh, they've met their target of, of 2%. So it's coming down nicely, and you can actually see, if you look at the last few months and you extrapolate that out for the next year, it's actually where they want to be. And they like this, but now they're saying they want to see that it lasts longer. And they're beginning to aggravate many economists because what economists think are they're going to be a little bit late on finally reducing rates because they wait too long. It's kind of like the reverse engineering of this that they did in 2022 when they knew in 2021 that they had a problem, but they waited. And there was a problem and they knew as far as the fall of 2021, they waited all the way till March of 2022 to start reversing things and rates went up and they stopped buying mortgage-backed securities and a whole bunch of other things and then we so we saw those rates come up but they were late to the party they should have started many many months prior and uh, the same thing with this PCE it shows that they're nice uh, they're they're where they need to be they need to make a move because th these inflation gauges as we track them and we start peeling them back they are going to go down and they uh, the longer they wait the more they become excessively restrictive and they, something else that happened last week was this producer price index year over year actually had this bit blip higher. And you can see this, this little blip. See that little purple blip where it went up on the right-hand side and pointing to it? It did that before. If you look prior to COVID, you could see how jagged it is. We get these different nuances in the numbers. I'm not concerned about it. It's one report, but yet all the market went nuts over this, and they don't typically go nuts over this. And we had this big swing in rates for the day. And the only reason that is happening right now is because the Fed is so data dependent and they're not making a move yet. So uh, really, they honestly know that they're overly restrictive. Interest, they have these short-term rates at about 5.5% and inflation's coming down nicely towards 2%. That's too big of a gap. They know it's too big of a gap. So they're waiting to make sure, certain, that this is where it, it actually is. And they're hopefully they're not relying on CPI because that the way that they, they gauge rent is totally uh, totally backwards and it is there's giant delays in it. So we know that the Fed will be uh, cutting rates this year. It's just a matter of when, not if. And it's looking more and more like it's not going to be in March when they meet. It's not going to be in uh, May when they meet. It's most likely going to be June. I hope they surprise everybody and do it earlier because they need to do it sooner rather than later. The longer they, they wait, the more economic damage that they could possibly cause because there are a lot of things that are pegged to these higher rates and there's already some headwinds. Speaking of economic headwinds, you can see the economic headwinds in uh, right here's where we have personal savings rate at the lowest level since 2009. So much lower than where we were prior to COVID. And then the uh, excess savings from all the stimulus packages as of, this is like an uh, estimate from the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, down to $290 billion as of November, 2023. And based upon their metrics, it looks like the excessive savings will be depleted sometime this quarter of 2024. So definitely this year, the 
they're going to be running out of that excess savings, not saving like they used to, running out of excess savings and putting everything on plastic. This is credit card debt. Just zooming, zooming up higher at, a, at an incredible clip. And you can actually see this in numbers. I actually peeled this back, made sure that this was real. This wasn't a scare tactic, but there really is a problem on the credit card side of things. Everybody's putting on plastic and the rates are really high, the highest levels in years because of where short-term rates are. Short-term rates actually affect instantaneously uh, automobile loans, credit card debt, and equity line of credit. So, and you can see it in credit card uh, debt. And, and then you can see retail sales. Retail sales, actually, this is a cautionary yellow flag that needs to be taken seriously. For the month of January, you could see how it came down. That's on the right-hand side, and that is, one of the economic signs that shows that there could be some trouble ahead. Another one is this. You could see this is loan delinquency. Credit card loan delinquency is that, that like uh, light uh, colored line. And automobile loan delinquency is the red line. It is at the highest level going back all the way to where we were in the Great Recession. So that is an issue that it's starting to climb and it's climbing at a pretty big clip. And this is something to watch because this will affect consumption when people run out of money uh, as far as on credit cards because their credit card balances are rising too much and they don't have as much saving and their excess savings are gone and then they have problems with delinquencies. This starts to muck up the economy a bit. It does not cause a recession, but what it does is it says we're kind of reading, reaching the top, the climax right before it starts going down. And that is where we are as far as the economy soon this year. When is it exactly going to happen? Nobody really knows, but something's going to break and then the economy will slow down. Not recession. That's not what we're talking about, but still a slowdown. Now, the safe haven when we start getting these economic numbers is Daddy Warbeck's cash is going to go to 10-year treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, interest rates will fall then. So there, here we are, right, right just above 7%. That's when we will fall to that next level. When will that happen? I don't know. Do you fish? Nobody precisely knows when the economic readings will come out that will support when uh, the, the rates will fall and the economy is slowing. But when it does happen, very, very likely this year, we give it like a very strong chance that it's happening by summer. It's like a, we think either spring or summer, we'll definitely see it. There's just a slight chance that it happens uh, later on in the year, like in, in the autumn. And then you're looking at interest rates between six to six and a half percent. So when they fall to that level, then we're going to get this momentous change in the housing market. Then later on this year, it depends upon how early it happens in, in uh, this economic cycle. If it happens by the time we get, uh, you know, halfway through summer, we could even see interest rates in the fives. I'm talking like 5.9999. That will be a big difference and will start to move the number of homeowners that actually place their homes on the market. That will be a big game changer. So that's something that we're watching. If you want to know, there are so many economic calendars out there. You can actually see this. And if you see these uh, orange versus red lines, I just peeled out all the ones that actually have movement in the market. The ones that are red really do affect the 10-year uh, the treasury and mortgage-backed securities. These have a big uh, giant effect. And this is for the month of March. There's CPIs on here. Labor reports are on here. Uh, PPIs on here. A whole bunch of different numbers are on here that will actually affect the, uh, the uh, market so that you'll see a change in rates for the day based upon what's going on. And let's talk about its impact. These higher rates are impacting demand. And let's talk about that. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsor once again, our sponsor is uh, Pillar to Post, the ultimate home inspection experience. Pillar to Post, they are home inspectors. They have uh, PTP 360 degree uh, interactive visual inspection summaries. So this is standard with every uh, home inspection. They have a cost estimate for inspection summary items as well. This is where they go above and beyond, pillar to post. And they uh, also included with a premium and prestige package is a floor plan, an accurate floor plan of the entire home uh, so that it can help you with shared dimensions with contractors for estimating. And there's even ho a home manual that's included. They now do inspections, sewer scope inspections and termite inspections, pillar to post home inspections. Contact Paul Camarena. 
Paula Camarena, actually Paula Camarena at 714-794-5295. That's 714-794-5295. Pillar to post, Paula Camarena. Thanks, Paula, for your uh, for your sponsorship. And now let's get back to the housing market and the impact that we're already seeing. Now you can't really see it when you look at macro. This is this is Southern California where demand is. That spike is so far in 2024. That doesn't tell you much. Each one of these Himalayas is a year. However, this tells us something that you could see. Do you see the purple line? It's slightly less than the blue line. Why is it slightly less than the blue line? Because interest rates are almost a half a point higher than where they were last year at this time. So the month of February 2023 versus the month of February 2024, interest rates are higher this year. And so, so far, you could see that we're at 10,408, which is up 9% in a two-week period of time. Now, last year, it went up at a, at a better clip uh, and it was closely mirroring last year and it started back in November of last year. That's the orange line versus the blue line. And this year, it is very, very similar until all of a sudden within the last couple of weeks. Last year, we were at 11,083. That's 6% more demand than where we are today. It's slight. Now, if you ask people that are involved in the real estate market, they say, I don't notice a difference. But I've seen this difference in all kinds of cities all across SoCal, the Bay Area, everywhere that we that we actually crunch numbers and we're seeing this change in demand. And where we should be, the three-year average prior to COVID is 15,355. That's that green dot. That's 48% higher than where we are today. That's where demand should be if it were a normal market. I give up the three-year average because that's prior to COVID, 17, 18, and 19, just for reference. And then where are we going from here? Well, typically the uh, demand peaks during the springtime, but this year because of subdued in, uh, or too high of uh, of uh, interest rates are subduing the, the demand curve that you're seeing that it's flat, but as rates drop like uh, that, that are projected later on this year, you can actually see this bump in demand. We've seen this before. This actually happened in 2020. This also happened in 2019 as rates came from the heights of 5% at the end of 2018 and continue to make their way down to, uh, to less than 4%. By the time we finished 2019, and that made a big difference as far as demand was concerned for all markets. And uh, this is Bay Area. I'm just showing you Bay Area so you could actually see that the Bay Area has, this is all, uh, there are a bunch of counties, nine counties that we put aggregate together and you can see what's happening to demand. It's actually going, it's, not, it's still going up, but not like it did last year. It was closely mirroring last year. Now it's less. Why? Because of higher interest rates, 7% or higher. And because we had rates that were higher or lower last year. So this low, low, low demand that we're experiencing, and it's pretty low right now. It's even lower than where it would be if we had interest rates below 7%, is duking it out with low supply. Because people think that that value should crater, but the problem is, is we just don't have the inventory for it. So it's still really hot out there. It's just not as hot as it would be if interest rates were a bit lower than where they are today. So the low inventory, this actually came out this morning uh, or today. The uh, National Association of Realtors say there's now a million 10,000. There was a million uh, uh, homes on the market for December. In January, it's now at a million 10,000. But when I draw a line across, you could see this is an extremely low level. It is just extremely low. And it's what we refer to as supply scarcity. I was uh, talking today to uh, at a, at a uh, middle school, and it's just like this. It's like as if there are, uh, there, it's Girl Scout cookie season, and there are only two Thin Mints. And everybody, and that's all the inventory for all of your area. Area. And everybody loves Thin Mints. They like to freeze them and eat them. So if everybody wants them, there's only two boxes left. They all get around. They're going to bid for them. That's kind of what we're dealing with right now with the supply scarcity. The problem is, is the prices are so high and the rates are so high that it's kind of creating a, a bit of an issue. However, that's what we're dealing with right now. We have very, very low supplies. And then you can compare that to where we were. This was even prior to the Great Recession. That was 2006, that first Himalaya. Then it was 2007, 2008. 4 million homes on the market. That's a supply glut versus 1 million homes on the market right now, 1 million 10,000. 
supply scarcity. Supply glut is where you have 200 boxes of Girl Scout cookies, and as a parent, you had to buy them all, and there was another Girl Scout on the on the block that just sold all, to all the houses. Now you're sitting with these 200 boxes. What are you going to do? You're going to reduce the asking price of these boxes and sell them for under market. That's what happened during the Great Recession. And uh, so Southern California active listings, you can see right now it's at 20,332. What do you notice in this line? It's actually going up a little bit when last year it was going down. And uh, that was 2023. The inventory kept on falling until it got all the way to about April. It actually went up 113 within the last couple of weeks. And last year we were at 20,802, very close to where we are. There are some markets that are a little bit higher, some markets that are a little bit lower, but it's definitely for SoCal is going to cross over. And as far as where we were prior to COVID, 2017, 18, 19, nearly 35,000 homes. That's not even when we had a supply glut. That's when the market was normal. The expansion years between 2012 and 2019, the average is all the way up there, 35,000 homes. And as far as the Bay Area is concerned, it was closely mirroring where we where we were last year. And all of a sudden, within the last, uh, this is actually the last couple weeks, there we go, there's been a spike in the Bay Area and it has everything to do with the, the uh, higher rates. So what's the speed of the market? How fast is this market moving? Well, if you look at the, uh, if that's San Diego, that's funny. Uh, if you look at Southern California, this is where we are right now. Uh, we are at 59 day expected market time that was down four days. And uh, last year it was at 56 days. So it was actually faster last year. So you can see we're going down like we normally do. We went down four, but last year at this time we went down eight. It went down significantly. So it's actually crossed over. We it, The market's a little bit slower than last year. If you ask anybody that's in the marketplace, they wouldn't know the difference. The three year average prior to COVID is actually 69 days. So it still feels hot in the marketplace, but we're starting to see it mess with the numbers, mess with the number of pending sales, which would mess with the number of closed sales. And you could see in the Bay Area, uh, similarly, all of a sudden it's following that blue line that was last year and now boom, it's different. It actually went up within the last couple of weeks. So there you go. If you like what you, the content that, you, that you've seen today, please like our channel. Please subscribe to our channel. That will get more and more people in front of it. it, it I'm, I'm tired of all the, the stuff out there. There's so much on the internet. You can find whatever narrative, whatever angle you want, but this is based upon facts and data and statistics and people think that I'm just blowing smoke, but this is real. This is what I do. We're housing analysts. This is all we do. And you can see right now, not going to be any crash, no good foreclosure wave, all that stuff. We've dealt with that in all of our other uh, uh, reports and you can see them on our videos. Go to reportsonhousing.com. Do yourself a favor. Subscribe to our report. We have a plethora of uh, reports. We're even going to hit Phoenix and, and Vegas starting at the start of May. The recent report that came out is called the rate migration, kind of talking about uh, more of this, the nuances of what's going on with interest rates, what goes on with affordability based upon when it goes up and down and what are the difference in payments. And if you want a if you utilize a coupon code for a free month, that is RAIN. RAIN is for a free month. So you can... You can uh, Subscribe, use the coupon code RAIN because in SoCal we've had way too much of it recently and it's supposed to rain next Monday too. And our latest uh, podcast was dropped wherever you like to listen to podcasts. It's uh, Reports on Housing, Let's Talk Housing. And the most recent one that came out Wednesday, Our Recession Concerns Valid. Well, I want to thank you so much for tuning in to yet another housing debrief. It's been fun. Uh, just keep on uh, checking in to see where the market's at. No one knows exactly when the market is going to speed up when rates come down, but I'll tell you, we're going to be on the sidelines every step of the way, bringing you the latest and greatest. So have a great finished your week. We will see you on the other side.